Hello, hello, and welcome. I have made a massive mistake, and I have not put the correct link. So I'm getting a thousand emails. So I'm trying to respond to people um, and copy pasta the right link to them so they can join. Um, so I apologize, and I'm gonna just kind of do this before I get started, and then at a certain point, I gotta ignore it and get going. Um, yeah, man, talk about the emails are flowing in. <laughs> I, I'm apparently people are excited to join this and I'm excited to share. Um, I've spent a little bit of time trying to get this, uh, going and, um, really prepping this for you guys, um, to identify what I guess really, what are the key attributes to identify emerging markets? Now, um, there will be, I'm going to show you some markets. Uh, I'm obviously going to give you lots of examples of emerging markets, um, however, I'm also going to show you some markets that might have appeared to be emerging, but they're not in reality actually emerging. And there's going to be certain data points that I want to show you that are going to tip to uh, basically tip the hat of, Hey, this is an emerging market or it's not an emerging market. Um, but the secret though, there's no like, you know, sweet recipe to, or I guess fast and easy way to find um, emerging markets, you literally have to do the research, but you want to look for certain things. And so that's what I'm going to show you is the, um, is what are those certain things that you need to identify in order to know if this is an emerging market, short-term rental market or not. Um, I am still, uh, okay. So the emails have slowed down. I see the number of people have joined, have increased. So I'm going to keep an eye on it, but um, I'll give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Um, I am doing this via, um, uh, so this is obviously on StreamYard. So I'm posting this in Facebook groups and YouTube. So you can ask questions and that's what I want to do. And there's a purpose of this was I wanted to um, give you guys an opportunity to ask me questions along the way. So it's not just me talking the entire time. Um, my daughter, uh, I took my daughter to, we went to church on Sunday. We, I took her to a nursery uh, while I was there and she got sick. So I'm kind of feeling it too. So I might not go the full two hours and that's okay. Um, but uh, I feel free to ask questions along the way if I skip something um, for the sake of fatigue. So I'll, I'll answer the best of my ability. Um, so while you guys are joining and everything, uh, thank you, Tyler. What is the meaning of life? Um, I guess we do have two hours, so I can spit. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, uh, if you guys want to post where you're from, I want to like where you're calling in from, or I guess not calling in from, but uh, watching from, um, feel free to go ahead and uh, do that while we're waiting. I want to start in about one or two minutes. So let me know, post in the comments, um, where are you uh, dialing in from? And somebody already asked about Albania. I'm not sure, like, is a city in the US. I, I only talk about cities in the US. Um, so please put any uh, comments or questions or whatever. Um, it looks like we're getting a lot of people from, whoa, Phoenix and Austin and Wisconsin and Washington and wow, Vail, Vail, Colorado. That must be a fun place to live. Um, Oregon and Granite Bay, California, Bentonville, Arkansas. Cool. Palo Alto, California. New York City. All right. Seems like we are, man, my inbox blew up <laughs> with that. Sorry. Sorry, everybody, if you didn't get the right link. Um, and this is going to be recorded. Uh, I mean, now that I've probably said that, a lot of people are probably just going to, you know, oh, I'll just watch the recording. Um, I do encourage you to watch this live so you can ask questions. That's the biggest thing. I mean, you're, you're going to ask some questions um, to really help you identify um, help you learn the process of how to identify emerging short terminal markets because there's quite a few out there. Did you know that there's like over 13,000 short terminal markets in the United States? That's crazy. Most of them, so when I say most of them, meaning like less than, or sorry, more than like about 1,600 of them have less than 100 active listings. So like that's what 11,500. So all, you know, 90 or I guess like 80%, 80% plus of short terminal markets in the United States have less than 100 active listings. And so for me, I don't define a market 
as like the geographical boundaries and SDR insights or whatever data platform you're using. I see it as a region. And when we start looking at regions, which a lot of people don't necessarily do, I mean, we kind of do it in some of the bigger markets. Like you might hear, you know, Western North Carolina or the Smokies or the Emerald Coast or the Forgotten Coast. Like those are regions of a market. However, the emerging markets also have a region as well that make up of different mini markets or just individual markets that you can look into the tool. And the reason why a lot of investors haven't picked up on those quite yet is because they're just seeing the individual small markets and those have less than 100 active listings. But when you combine it together, you see kind of this whole area that's really, really strong and has a lot of tourism. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at the different things that um, make up that uh, that tour, like the key attributes of that tour. How much tourism do I need to see in this market for it to be considered emerging or growing? Because that's really what we're looking for is growth in the market and opportunity in the market. Okay, so the emails have slowed down. My inbox has <laughs> stopped exploding for sending out the wrong link. For those of you who have just hopped on, I apologize if you got the wrong link. I apparently sent it to a calendar. Um, and so it is, um, you know, why you just streamed on Facebook or YouTube. Obviously, you can get the recordings afterwards as well. So let's get started because we've already gone into it. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys and show you a presentation um, and show you what we need to do to find emerging markets. So let's let's do it. All right. Let me share. Let's see if there's a way I can do this. There we go. See if I can move my head or something. And it doesn't matter. All right. So we're obviously going to be talking about <clears throat> how to find emerging STR markets. Now, the biggest thing that we want to do with finding emerging STR markets is understand the keyword STR, not long-term rental, not mid-term rental, not, um, you know, like a one-time hit. And I think that's where a lot of confusion is going to be is there's been a lot of markets that have popped up in the last two to three years because of COVID that give the inclination that it's emerging. But in reality, it hasn't truly been emerging. And we're going to look at certain data points that you're going to be able to go out and find too. I love to show people how to find things for free. And so I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, and I also love showing people, hey, if you want to save time, there's a faster way to do it. It's paid. And so I'm going to show you guys some of that as well. So you kind of have both options there. So you're not, oh, you know, I have to, you know, subscribe to something new or I have to go pay for this or pay for that. You can get everything for free if you just spend a little more time. Once again, time for dollars. We keep that in mind. Um, all right. Let's get into it. So let's define, let's first define what an emerging market is, because a lot of people have different definitions of it. Um, and it's really important that we just kind of get the generic, let's understand the what it tr an emerging market truly is. So an emerging market is a market in the process of shifting to a mature, developed destination where growth is steady and regulatory risks are low. Okay, so there's two big pieces in this. Um, so a mature, developed destination, so a destination that people are traveling to. Okay, so could be a lake, could be a beach, it could be a mountain, it could be, you know, uh, uh, a rock. I don't know. Like it's it's a destination where a certain amount of people are going to it every single year and there's steady growth. Meaning not just because of COVID, we saw a bump, but because of, you know, some sort of factors in the market, like it's been steady over time. So the biggest thing is, uh, to understand that one, it's not just, hey, some market that got popular because of COVID and now it's you know less popular and people are no longer traveling there. No, it's it's been growing in popularity over time. We understand that. Okay. Regulatory risk. So this one's going to be the biggest debatable one. When I say regulatory risks are low, I mean, does the community and keep it this simple in your definition, does the community recognize short-term rentals as a positive for tourism and for their economy. 
That's that's as easy as it's going to get. And that's as com- well, I guess that's as complicated as I want to get with this definition of regulatory risks are low because everybody thinks, oh, well, there's regulation. So it's scary and I can't go into that market. And that's not true. I'm personally invested in six properties in New York, all heavy regulated markets. One's probably too regulated, but it is a vacation destination. So why am I in that market? Because there's a cap on supply and there's a ton of demand and the town survives on tourism. They're not anti-short-term rentals. They're not anti-tourism because their economy relies upon it. So they're positive, but they just want to have rules and regulations that make sense. Sometimes they go a little overboard and they make some assumptions of things, you know, logically, oh, you know, we should cap the number of cars that can park at this house because that will prevent parties. When in reality, that isn't really what prevents parties. But you can see like they can make additional rules that make it harder. However, the sentiment, people aren't against me having a short-term rental. My neighbors don't care because there's other short-term rentals around. They know there's been short-term rentals in that market for decades. So it's not some sort of, you know, surprise. And I'm not coming in there. However, the market has grown in terms of the demand for tourism. And the reason why I'm in it is because the supply is capped. So emerging markets, you're going to see a steady growth over the last, well, I, I like to see steady growth over the last at least decade or two. And then also the town or the cities in the surrounding area are positive towards short-term rentals because maybe one, their economy relies on it, or two, they're not big enough to like try to organize together to be against short-term rentals. But most of the time I'm looking for towns that are positive towards tourism and the idea of short-term rentals. And if you're like, okay, well, what if my town or what if the town I'm looking into doesn't, you know, is or isn't, how do I know? Either Google it or just call them. Just call and ask somebody there. Hey, how do you guys feel about short-term rentals in your area? Is there, or talk to a host there. Are there a lot of people against you being in that market? Those are things that we want to ask um, to really know, like just get the sentiment. That's really what it is. Understand the sentiment of the market and how people feel there. Um, and in emerging markets, people are always going, for the most part, you know, there's always some outliers uh, who the recluses of the world who don't want, you know, their diamond in the rough, uh, beautiful market to be like everybody coming to it. But the fact of the matter is people have been going to that market already and it's growing consistently. And the general sentiment of the towns, the businesses, everything thrive off of that traffic. All right. Um, so. Yeah, I, I someone just said maybe ask a, a local realtor. That is a great way to do it too. So talk to a realtor. Um, hey, how do people feel about you know short term rentals in this market? Um, are you using outside data outside of rental revenue to measure growth? Yes, I am, and I'm going to show you. I'm not even going to show you rental revenue in this training. That's how like. You don't need to necessarily see rental revenue to identify an emerging market. There are other attributes to to identify to find emerging markets. Okay, so um, let's talk about the key attributes. So here are the three things beyond just rental revenue. So rental revenue is something that I'll do last after I've already done these three things. So number one, we talked about in the definition, steady tourism growth. So how many people are traveling to that region or that market to like for whatever purpose, which is the attractions. So typically what I like to see in an emerging market, a consistently emerging market is growth around, you know, people be tra- about a million, uh, 900 to a million plus people travel there each year. So that's a number one big thing. Um, and I'll tie this into, it's going to tie into each of these. But, uh, and I'll talk about this one. So I'll keep coming back to this growth. All right. So we want to see year over year growth. Now, growth sometimes, depending on the market, depending on what the attraction is, could be up and down, but you're going to see a steady trend line um, of it just consistently going up when we look at, you know, if we smooth out that line for the growth there. And and I'll explain that in a second by showing you some data graphs. Um, The next thing is, uh, second, I'm still sending some emails here, the track, the attraction. So I love, so obviously to be an emerging market, to be a good market to invest in, you have to have some sort of nearby attraction. Now, 
I'm going to show you different types of attractions. So don't think like, oh, it has to be Disneyland or it has to be the beach or it has to be the mountain views. I mean, I'm going to show you national parks. I'm going to show you universities, towns that are merging the university towns. Um, I'm going to show you actual attraction like ski towns and some other different examples of emerging markets that are all focused based on attractions. Um, so attractions is a general word, but basically it's the traffic driver for that location. Okay, this is the big. This is one of the bigger ones that people struggle with: low short-term rental inventory. What I like to see, not in the market. Remember, so we're going to call a market a region for this workshop, whatever we're calling this. We're going to call it a region. So when I say market, think region. Don't think you know that individual area that I just called or the city or the town. Think a region. Typically in, so if a, if an area has over a million plus people going to it per year, I want to see an emerging market. I want to see that market, the region have less than a hundred or sorry, less than a thousand active listings. So if it has more than a thousand active listings, is it still emerging? Yeah, it could be. It could be more on the mature side. Remember it's turning the definition. It's, it's a mature, becoming a mature destination. So Let's take the Smokies, for example. Are the Smokies an emerging market? No, they're an established market because they have each of these different things. They're, it's way popular and it has way more than a thousand active listings. Um, when you think of uh, a good example of a market that just, in my opinion, is above uh, an emerging short-term rental market is Branson, Missouri. So Branson in the last, especially because of COVID, has a really blown up, but the growth has been steady over the last few decades. However, even before COVID, it was still really, really high. And it wasn't until after COVID that we started getting the active listing count well over a thousand into like, I think it's like two or 3000 in that general area. Remember region, think region. So is it an emerging market? No. Some people might say, well, you know, it's getting more and more popular and that's fine. The Smokies are getting more and more popular too. And people are still traveling to it but is not an emerging STR market that people are just now discovering? No, it isn't. It's an established vacation destination. So that would not be an emerging market. Let's, we'll get into the examples in a second. Um, one other piece that I want, it's important, not every emerging market needs to fit this, but most of them will. And that's their proximity to a major city. Now keep in mind, to that. Um, so also guys, if you have questions about what I say, or you're like, wait a second, what does that mean? Can you clarify? Please post it in the chat. I am going to take questions live as we go uh, so that you do it. If you're on Facebook, YouTube, please uh, like or subscribe as well. Um, if you find this content valuable, yes, this will be available afterwards as well on YouTube so you can watch it. Um, let's talk about uh, one other thing I didn't put on here because uh, there's a few markets that don't fit this, but most emerging market, a key attribute is they are near driving proximity of at least two major cities. When I say two, like, so within, you know, big cities within, we'll say three to four hours max driving distance of two major cities, two to three. I like to see three, but two is pretty common for most of them. There's a few I'm going to show you uh, one that's like, a good distance from one, but it's really, really popular in the trends and it hits, checks all these different boxes and it's doing really well. So I, I didn't throw that key attribute in here because it's not, you know, by law, but for the most part it is. Um, and I want to show you an example. Is the market the same as a city? No, a market. So a city would not be an emerging market. I mean, here's the truth, guys. Every, like, mo most cities are almost every city, every city that it, short term rentals are allowed. So we'll start there. Every traditional vacation market has already been found. There's like no true emerging beach markets anymore. They're just, they're already are discovered. There's already a ton of short term rentals there. People have already been looking there. It's all popular. These are areas that are like growing. Most of the areas that you may have heard of them, or you're like, oh, I know of that, or I heard about it in a movie, or I, but you don't know anybody investing there. And that's because right here, there's low STR inventory and it's growing and it's starting to gain traction, which is what you're looking for in an emerging market. Um, 
is it so someone asked is it typically more lucrative to invest in emerging markets versus established markets that really depends on what your goals are so you have to be careful with this am i saying you need to go to an emerging market and you're going to make more money there not necessarily because emerging markets the prices of homes are typically less than more established vacation homes the cash flow could be less than typical vacation destinations as well so but the cash on cash will be higher on average the cash on cash meaning how much money you get back for that down payment and everything you put back into that house so how quickly you get that money back is going to be higher in emerging markets so if your goal is cash on cash return then an emerging market you should be looking for emerging markets um let's let's sorry since since but that's a, that's a great question so if you guys have any more questions like that feel free to um ask that but please don't take in uh i'm not talking about like please don't take it that i'm against established markets or vacation markets i'm i'm just showing you how to identify emerging markets to invest in appreciation it's a good point. Um, obviously, there's some risk with appreciating appreciation in um, emerging markets. So, for example, um, you know, are you going to get massive appreciation? You're one. No, you're not. Not like traditional vacation markets. However, because the growth is increasing, you will get the benefit of appreciation over time, significant appreciation over time. And that's why we want to track growth of tourism and growth of the area population um, to understand how that market's growing and the benefits of appreciation. Um, in emerging markets, is it a good idea to look for rapid appreciation? Uh, no, that's not what we're looking for. We want to look for consistent growth over decades of time. A lot of places received, and this is what to watch out for, the perfect segue into this. So great question. Um, whoever asked, I just see Facebook user. So everybody benefited from the COVID bump. So what a lot of people get confused about is they'll see markets where the revenue, especially revenue, they'll look solely at revenue for a particular market and they'll go, wow, that's jumped up. Like it must be a good market to invest into. And the problem is um, it's deceitful because we know, especially this year, numbers are starting to drop back down. Now, whether they go back pre-COVID or they've kind of established some baseline that's a little bit above pre-COVID, but still below like 2021 numbers, it, you know, it, it differs market to market. However, a lot of markets and what I would call the pretenders benefit from the COVID bump, which made them seem like established or even emerging markets. And in fact, most of the markets across the country received some sort of COVID bump that made them look like they're emerging. However, not all markets are emerging. Um, and most are what I would call the pretenders. So we need to not discount what properties have made or what the market has done in the last few years, but just beware. If I'm looking for an emerging market, I'm not just going to look for immediate rapid growth in the last few years. That's not, it's almost like to me, like a get rich quick scheme in a sense. Like it's like, oh wow, this market shot up. So it must be good. It, they, like everybody made a ton of money really quickly and I can do the same thing in that market. That's not the case. We're looking for consistency of growth, uh, whether that's the growth of the population or the tourism um, or even revenue as well. Consistency over time. Um, we also want to we want to avoid markets that had a surge, a huge surge in active listings. So a lot of markets, especially recently, like I mean, we jumped from in the last year or two. It, it's been a little over a year. We jumped from like 1.3 million Airbnb listings to like 1.8. And it's still growing. Um, and I mean, that's crazy. That's a crazy new amount of short-term rentals in the industry. So everywhere saw like essentially a surge. But what I'm talking about is a surge of 100% plus in active listings. All right. Now, you know, once again, you, you do have markets like say, take, for example, the Smokies, where you had a lot of property management companies and they started listing on Airbnb. And so it looked like the number of Airbnb shot through the roof in the Smokies, whereas maybe it was instead of 60% growth, it was maybe 40 or even 30%. Okay, but the Smokies are not an emerging market. So we're only talking about emerging markets here. I have nothing against the Smokies, um, but I just keep in mind, a lot of these markets are not going to see the emerging markets haven't seen this massive, massive surge, doubling, tripling even of the number of active listings 
in the last three years. It's grown, but it hasn't like exploded through the roof. And that's why like most people don't know where the emerging markets are because like people aren't investing in them because they don't know where they are. Um, and then also what we want to do is avoid any market. This is just in general. You should avoid any market like investing in any market that's seeing about a 15% plus pullback in revenue. So if I'm looking and I'm going to show you a market in a second and um, please don't take this as I hate this market or I, I you know don't invest, but essentially be cautious and understand that these are not emerging markets. Okay. So um, let me see this. The, uh, so yeah, let's, let's jump into it for, to give this a better example. So Blue Ridge, um, a lot of people have classified me as the Blue Ridge hater. I'm not the Blue Ridge hater. Um, I just am very cautious of this market for a number of reasons. Uh, and the, the first reason is the fact that it has, um, it is just, I mean, it exploded during COVID and then it reset. And it's because of what we're seeing in, you know, travel. So pe think about it. People who go to Blue Ridge, Georgia, or the North Georgia mountains, they don't fly in to Atlanta and then drive there. They just drive in from Atlanta. So they're Atlanta residents. So number one, if we go back to my bonus key attributes, what did I say? Two major cities nearby. Blue Ridge is only near Atlanta for the most part, like major city. It's only near Atlanta. So Nashville is pretty far, but people from Nashville don't go to Blue Ridge. They go to the Smokies if they're going to go into the mountains. You know, people in Asheville, they're already in the mountains. So why would they go to Blue Ridge? So in reality, it's simply, you know, Blue. it's Atlanta folk going to Blue Ridge. And we saw a jump in COVID. So this is data from the uh, National Parks Statistics, which I'm going to use reference. It's free. You can Google it, National Park visitation statistics, they'll show you, you can get into their database and you can see the charts and the graphs and the numbers. And this is the stuff that I'm talking about that you need to be cautious of. So this is Blue Ridge and obviously like 1940, way long time ago. So I don't really care about that, but you can see the trend line. It went up and then it went down and it kind of came back up again, then back down. And then it shot up during COVID. So see here, and then it's kind of going back down again. So guess what it's probably going to do? Go back down. OK, so there's no consistent growth. There's no like large like, hey, this is doing really well. And then what did we see in terms of so this is just tourism numbers. So people going to that market, which is important because it's giving us an idea of demand. So how many people are traveling to that market? Now, this is a lot of people. But remember, it's one. This is the, the Blue Ridge Parkway. So people aren't necessarily staying there and they're traveling through there. But two, there's only one major city nearby. So let's look at the number. So, all right, that's the first like red flag to me. If you're just looking at pure tourism numbers, which is where you should start. The second, uh, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> okay, Ryan uh, Bakey calling me the North Georgia mountain hater. <laughs> so, anyway, um, the second, I, I'm not a mount, I'm not the Blue Ridge hater. So please, but just be wary of investing in markets like this. These are key indicators. Of things to watch out for. So the second thing we want to look at, remember, is the supply. So how has the supply of active rentals looked in the last like three to four years? So we start in 2018 at 589, and then it's just exploded, doubled over the last you know four years. So to me, that's that's just Blue Ridge. Now Blue Ridge, that's like the city. That's not. Ella J in Morgantown and um, Hiawassee and some of the other surrounding areas like that's that's just Blue Ridge, Georgia. Now, if you're sitting here going, hey, guys, I, you know, Kenny, go ahead and hate on Blue Ridge. Like I'll still invest here. Great. If you can find stuff that makes sense, do that. But for the new investor looking for an emerging market, this ain't it. You can't call Blue Ridge an emerging market. OK, two red flags out the gate and, and the revenue is dropping as well. And the revenue, in fact, we had just ran this yesterday, it's dropped year over year 21% on average. So that's not a good indicator. Now, I always say you don't invest in markets, you invest in properties in markets. So certain properties could be doing better year over year, but the market as a whole is not. And so what that means for a new investor is the probability of you finding a good deal in that market and succeeding 
are a lot lower than looking in maybe say another market where the numbers are a little bit better. So that does once again, I'm not saying don't go invest in Blue Ridge. All I'm saying is Blue Ridge is not an emerging market, even though it's you know popped up recently in the last few years. There is a ton of markets like this. Um, Granbury, Texas, for example, a lot of lake markets in Texas did this in the last three years exploded. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're starting to like come back down again to reality. We don't like to see the, uh, that kind of, um, and it, it's not, when I say exploded, I'm talking not only about revenue, but also the amount of people going to the market. That's the biggest thing, right? I mean, that's what dictates revenue. So revenue is kind of a byproduct of the amount of people going to the market and staying there, right? So we want to be, I mean, the easiest thing to do is find the foot traffic of that market to understand how it's doing. All right, let's answer a few questions. So where are you pulling the historical listing count from? Um, I mean, you can pull it from a bunch of different sources, but I, you know, I obviously have my own data from SDR Insights. Um, so, but I mean, there's a lot of different data providers out there that have the historic listing counts. Um, is there a function in SDR Insights that shows the rate of active listings the last few years? Nope, not yet. Um, and then how how big of an area region are you looking at? <clears throat> so it depends on the market. It depends on, um, I, I can't really define that. Some areas are going to be bigger than others. It's just kind of like, you know, the North Georgia mountains would be like a region. Um, there's probably, I would say, I would argue there's two regions to that, but in general, the markets overall perform about the same within each of those regions. So, you know, the Smokies, for example, like that's probably a smaller area than the North Georgia mountains. Um, I don't know someone could argue, but the fact of the matter is like, look at the tourism to those areas and see what the trends are. Um, how can I get this data from my market? So this is free data. I, I don't know which market you're talking about, but this data here is free and on the National Parks Statistics site. So you, they've got a database. You can pull this for free. It's really helpful. Um, where do I pull tourism data from? It depends on the market. And let me, I guess, let me get into this next part here because we're. I'll answer some of the questions through this. Uh, Broken Bow, Broken Bow, exa <laughs> same thing. <laughs> Is exactly the same song and dance. So it got really, really popular in the last like five years. And the fact that Broken Bow is in an opportunity zone that was determined back in like 2016, I think, should tell you the fact that it, it's not an emerging market. So um, it got really popular and then it's kind of sunk back down. Do I think investing in Broken Bow is a bad idea? No, not necessarily, but you need to be careful. Um, you need to pick the right area within Broken Bow to invest in in order to get the returns you're expecting to see. All right, let's talk about this part because this will answer some of the questions we're getting. How, so what are the steps? What am I using to find an emerging market? So number one, I'm doing market research. So I'm going and looking at the tourism foot traffic. So the first free way, if you're looking at markets with state parks or national parks or anything like that nearby, the government website, so like the... Um, you know, the national park, literally type in Google national park visitation statistics, and it will take you to their database and you can put in any national park and see even by park entrance too. That's really cool. Um, and you can see the foot traffic going to that. You can also use a, uh, it's not, well, if you do the free account, it's free. It's called placer.ai. Placer is a foot traffic. They use cell phone um, usage in those areas to ping or give you an idea of how much traffic to that. The free account is they only show you monthly data, like the last month, how many thousands of people are going to that. And it's only like retail stores and like um, hotels, which is helpful, uh, but it's not kind of like your overarching piece of the pie. So those are a couple sources. And then obviously like Googling and understanding like who's going there, but I'm going to show you and hopefully at the end of this, you'll kind of get an idea because there's a lot of different ways to do it. And honestly, like once you kind of have a theory or a thesis, I'll say about what you're looking for, it's it starts to get a lot easier to Google it um, and, and look for specific foot traffic. So I'll give you some examples and show you what I did to find those examples to help you kind of piece this together. Because right now I just talked about national parks, but there's universities or ski resorts, there's um uh, theme parks. There's all kinds of stuff that, that have emerging markets in them. Um, so, and once you get, Oh, Hey, I want to be near a theme park. Well, that, Hey, what's the foot traffic of to universal or Disney world or whatever. And that stuff becomes a lot easier to find once you have or get very specific. Um, 
the Ozark TV show has gave exposure during COVID. Yes. Uh, and I would argue that the Ozarks, Osage, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Osage Beach um, is emerging as well. So that one's not even on here. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> there's one. These steps seem to be, if you already have a market in mind, how do you get to that point prior? So Maggie, um, we want to first, we want to have a thesis for investing. So we want to know where we want to invest um, or not know where we want to invest, but we want to have an idea of like what we're trying to invest in. So like one, what's the purpose of the property besides just making money? Like how much, what do I need it to do? Do I want it to be in a market that has, you know, there's no such thing as a four season market, but like, can it be, does it need to be less seasonal or, you know, can it, can I, do I care about that? Do I care about seasonality? Do I need to be in a market that, um, you know, has a lot of short-term rentals or not. Like you start answering those questions that that'll give you an idea of what type of market you need to be investing in. Um, so like, let's take an example. If you want to invest in a market that uh, is less seasonal, then you're not going to go to maybe places up North. You're not going to go probably to beach markets. You're not. And so start eliminating the markets that don't make sense. And that will help you narrow down the markets that will make sense. So, um, so I mean, that that's kind of like the first step. So asking these simple questions of what do I prefer in the property I'm about to buy, whether that's revenue, um, you know, region, all these different fifth factors uh, and create a thesis, like a property and a market need to have these certain criteria and then start researching based on that. Um, beach market, low seasonality. <sighs> That might not exist. <laughs> I, that's pretty difficult. Um, beach markets are seasonal. So, I mean, that might be, you know, like that might not work, you know? And so that's that's part of like understanding if that's the case, then start researching markets, beach markets that are less seasonal and see what pops up. Like Google that. That's very specific. And Google can help you identify what types of markets or what areas of the country might have those things. Then you can start doing all these other steps. So, do the market research, understanding what your thesis in market is first. And when I say market research, I'm just saying understanding the foot traffic and the traffic drivers, not regulation, SDR, like all this other stuff that this is all part of technically all part of market research, but just understanding what's going on in those markets before you start diving into everything else. This will save you so much more time. Okay. Are all urban markets must much less seasonal? Uh, that's a loaded question. So technically, yes, but it depends on the urban market. So like I'm in Buffalo and we're obviously going to be more seasonal than probably some vacation markets. Um, but I mean, that's just because we're up north and we get a ton of snow. So obviously, like keep that in mind. Uh, so I, I mean, it just depends. But overall, yes. But you need to be careful with urban markets for the second point, which is regulation. So remember, emerging markets have low regulatory risks. So if that's the case, then we need to be making sure that whatever area we're looking into that, hey, how's the sentiment towards, you know, short term rentals in general. So speak to a realtor, call a host, reach out, ask somebody on Facebook, whatever it is, do that before and figure out what the regulations are for that particular market. If they have regulations. Don't be afraid to go into that market if the sentiment is positive. It's all about sentiment. It has nothing to do with the actual regulations. Okay. Now, if they're, I mean, if the regulations completely ban short term rentals, then obviously the sentiment's going to be negative. But if the sentiment and people are positive towards it and they just have some strict rules, don't run away from that. 90% of investors will run away because they're just afraid of regulation when, whereas it protects your business. So if you can get into a market like that, the more power to you that will help cap supply while demand continues to increase because in emerging markets, demand is continuing to increase. Um, okay. So let's talk about, so do your due diligence. So this is where you start. You, you've kind of found some areas that you want to go into. Um, now you can actually go into uh, in, in STR insights or uh, you know, try to use other data providers, but check active listing counts. Are these areas, are these regions that we're talking about, how many short terminals are that? Does everybody already know about these markets and is everybody already running to them? Don't chase markets, meaning don't go to places everybody else is going to just because they're going to it. 
make, create a thesis and invest in the market because of that thesis. Um, and then obviously you want to understand what the top properties in those markets are doing and why they're doing so well. So that's going to be really important to understanding, um, you know, the success of being in that market. We can't just invest in any old market these days. We have to invest in properties in the right locations with the right quality and design, decor, amenities, features, everything that maximize revenue in order to get the returns we're expecting. You know, you can't just go in the city and invest in the ghetto and expect to get good returns. You have to be strategic on where you invest. And you do that by studying what the top performers are going to do in each of those markets as well. Okay. And then finally, like studying the data, which I'm kind of talking about already, but look at the growth of the market and the infrastructure. I think that's really important is understanding tourism and then also looking and just Googling and researching are they growing? Are they, you know, what's the city doing to improve infrastructure or increase the size or, or handle all this, you know, new demand that's coming in over time? Um, and then obviously, like the biggest one for me, if you really want a safe emerging market, you want it to be near two to three major cities within a few hours. When I say few hours, three to four hours is a good driving distance that most people will go. Some people will go further, but for like a weekend trip or something, three to four hours is probably max and safe. OK, so keep that in mind. Major city, think, you know, over a million plus for a city definition. OK, Here, let's go into it. Start right away. All right. So let's let's actually look at the examples here. Um, so what what we're going to do is I'm going to show you some examples and then I'm going to pull out and show us your insights and show some of the markets in that area and show you why I think they're good. But we're going to go through the steps first. So we're going to. Yeah. So we're going to look at the tourism growth. We're going to look at the attractions and then we're going to look at the inventory of the market to show you why I believe this, these markets I'm going to show you are, um, are, uh, emerging markets and feel free to ask questions about this. Um, one thing about regulation. So a lot of markets across the country already have some sort of regulation. Remember, we're just looking for low regulatory risks, not no regulation. So if you message and comment about, oh, well, this market has regulation and I don't know. Remember, market is a region. So it's not just a city or a town, but an actual like area. So you might not be able to do it in the city center, but you can do it, you know, surrounding it. And so keep that in mind. Uh, and please don't post that in the comments because that's what I'll respond with because um, I get that all the time. So here's the first major uh, kind of emerging market that I've seen recently that's just kind of grown in popularity. So the Badlands National Park in Mount Rushmore. Um, so Badlands is actually over here. And I, I do, you know, you can invest. It's just like there's nothing out here, like town-wise. So a lot of people and a lot of guests will stay near Mount Rushmore when they go to see the Badlands. And they'll stay either in Custer, Keystone, Hill City, Three Forks, Crazy Horse, like this, this circled area that I have here. Hopefully you can see that. If you can't, please comment um, and let me know. But this area here is solid. Custer does have some regulations, like I mentioned before, but it's in the town. It's not just outside of it. So don't panic. Um, but a lot of this area is, uh, is, is pretty awesome for short-term rentals. Um, and obviously, people go to Mount Rushmore. I know you've heard of Mount Rushmore, but who's thought about investing near Mount Rushmore? Who's thought about investing in South Dakota? I mean, come on. Do people even like, yeah, there are people there and there are things there to do. So um, I'll zoom in in a second on the, the actual market when I go into STR Insights and show you the markets. Um, but let's look at the trend. So let's start from the beginning. Let's look at the data and see the growth. We just want to see population growth in this particular market. So, uh, well, sorry, not population growth, but tourism travel. Okay, so here's Mount Rushmore, just Mount Rushmore. This isn't the Badlands. I probably should have included that, but just Mount Rushmore. Okay, if, you know, I'm looking at the data here and what, you know, what do I see? It's a steady growth over time. And maybe, you know, you could cut out the section, well, we don't care about the eighties or the nineties, whatever, but two thousands, even then it's steady growth. The curve, if we smoothed it out, would be steady growth over time. So check box number one. Okay. People are coming here. All right. Well, how many people are going, you know, it doesn't matter if there's growth, like are actually people coming here. And, you know, if we're looking at the last, you know, however many years it's over 2 million 
Okay. And that's just Mount Rushmore. That doesn't take into account the Badlands as well. I mean, I'm sure people go to both at the same time, but if they're doing that, that means they're staying there for multiple nights, which is also a good indicator for short-term rentals. Okay. Um, let's jump out of this and go to STR Insights and actually look at um, look at the market from a standpoint or the markets and see how they're they're performing overall. So, and guys, I'm also showing you too, uh, a little bit of a sneak peek access. This is the new STR Insights that's going to be coming out. It will include market history, more stuff in the market profile, and then a map view as well. So you can identify markets based on like kind of like a Zillow zoom in, zoom out approach as well. Just a different way of doing it. So if I want to go into South Dakota and look at the area and the markets in that area. Um, oh, all right. So here, you know, here we are. Um, I, you know, I, I, you can go off three circles or, you know, the area, you've got Rapid City there, um, South Dakota, and I can scroll in and I can see the average ROI in this area. So Lead, Custer, Hill City, which are all like right there in that circle that I did, this area right there near Mount Rushmore is in like Keystone area, by the way. Um, so, and there, there's not like a whole lot, like in terms of like, people there. So they're all like Custer is probably the closest like town to, you know, Mount Rushmore. Um, but look, ROI of 16%, 15 and 12. That's really, really good. And the returns, and it looks like it's affordable. A lot of emerging markets are going to be more affordable than traditional vacation markets because prices aren't inflated due to all the demand and investors coming in. And, and also the number of tourists, I mean, the tour, obviously 2 million people, going and staying in Mount Rush or going to Mount Rushmore every year. That's a lot of people. But, you know, when you think about the Smokies, there's like 10 million people there. So obviously, but there's like the housing inventory is a lot higher. So prices are a lot more inflated there than say like, you know, these areas. So, um, but does it mean that this area is better invested than that? Remember, we're not investing in markets. We're investing in properties within markets. So it, it depends on the property and I'll always, you know, fight that to the stake. So, um, when does the update drop? We're hoping next week. I'll announce that. So it's going to come out soon. So you guys will have access to this kind of view and be able to play around with it. So what I want to show you, though, is look, here are the trends. It's checking all the boxes. And then look at the supply numbers. So the you know these markets, I think there's some up there, wherever on the map view. But just in this little area, which is these top three, that's less than 1,000 active listings. But that's a still healthy number of active listings where you still have access to cleaners, maintenance people, and your resources you need to run a successful short-term rental. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to just be in a market or an area where there's less than 100 active listings. We want to see a region where there's a good, um, like a decent amount, but not like thousands, you know, but we still have access to those resources. So people are doing it and they're being successful here based on this data. Um, but wouldn't South Dakota be highly seasonal as well as it drops below zero in the winter? Sure. But the, I mean, that's where your personal preference. So seasonality is a personal preference. So my, I'll, I'll uh, divulge this information. Um, I ran all my numbers for last year for my Watkins Glen property because I have a full year now of revenue. I bought that property for $350,000. I made, well, first, let me tell you this. My occupancy rate. My occupancy rate for the full year was 29%. 29%. And a lot of people be like, Kenny, you made a terrible investment. Why did you do that? That's super seasonal. I would never invest in that. You're a fool. And, you know, looking back at it, I'm like, wow, that's scary. But I made $95,000 in gross revenue off that property in one year. First year it was open, $95,000 off, of, off a $350,000 purchase. So with occupancy of 29%. So you say seasonal and I say, who cares? Because I'm focused on the cash flow. But if you're worried about seasonality, then this might not be the market for you. And I'll show you some other markets that might be more relevant and you might be interested in. But this is one way to find emerging markets. Emerging markets don't necessarily have to be near national parks. There's other attributes that uh, make them attractive or other destinations uh, or I guess uh, attractions, the word I'm looking for that make them more uh, appealing. So 
some of these markets might be for you or might might not be for you. So keep that in mind. So the first one we've got is um, is the the bad one. So let's keep going. Okay, I guess any any questions with that? Give that a second. Okay, keep moving. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, you can DM me. <laughs> I guess <laughs> somebody just said, "Wow, that's a lot." Uh, sure. I mean, I. Yeah, so I estimated close to a hundred. Um, didn't quite get there, and there are some reasons why. But uh, anyway, but yeah, it still did well. <laughs> Next one, Sleeping Bear Dunes, Michigan. So uh, this is a really, really cool place. I was looking at images of it, and th this is actually an image of it. Um, beautiful, like kind of national. Uh, I think it's a national seashore or something like that, or lake shores. But it's located at this red dot. It's like at the tip of Michigan. Um, I'll show you once again, we'll go into SDR Insights. I'll show you kind of the markets, but it's really, like I said, it's, it's a region. Now this region and this emerging market uh, are going to break some of my key attributes that I've outlined earlier. The simple fact of near, you know, near a major city. However, because it is a national park that drives its own appeal in and of itself. And then you also have Tra uh, Traverse City, which is really, really grown too. Um, but it's continually growing in this area. And so if we look at the data, so once again, let's cut out, I mean, sure, we can include if you really want to look at the 90s or whatever. But if we say, okay, let's look at maybe the 2000s up, you see this natural like increase. And sure, you might get one year it goes down, but then it starts to go back up and then down and then up. And then, you know, like you see this trend. And if we look at the numbers, it's increasing over time. So over 1.5 million people go to this seashore. And what I love about it is the fact that like there is literally not like many areas to stay in. And you'll notice that about a lot of emerging markets is geographically they're in like locations where there's just not a lot of room or like a lot of resources for new construction. So, I mean, that's positive and negative in a sense, but positive in a way that if you can get into that market, that really limits the amount of supply. And so that's one of the limitations why a lot of people aren't going to some of these markets is because there's just not a lot of supply or inventory or new construction going and being built. So it makes it harder to get into those. Um, so there are a lot of smaller markets in and around Black Hills. Yep, that's very true. Um, which, what, what are the numbers, which areas perform better? So with emerging markets, that's a really good question. Um, don't like, it's not necessarily like, oh, I have to be in Custer or I have to be in Black Hill or I have to be there. What we noticed, and let me go back to SDR Insights real quick. Um, a lot of the ROIs, so like Custer Hill City, they're next to each other and they're doing about the same. So it's not necessarily like, oh, which market, but identifying where in the markets and what does well in those markets. So if I was going to invest in, say, we'll pick Custer, if I was going to invest in Custer, the first thing I would do, and by the way, we're adding zip codes into SDR Insights, so it's going to get really cool soon. Um, anyway, uh, the first thing I would do is, okay, cool, Custer is a market I can invest in, but where in Custer should I invest? It's more of like, based on the specific location rather than just like, oh, which market? They're all roughly doing the same in the same region, which is what you want to see in an emerging market or just markets in general. You know, let's go back to the Smokies example. Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, uh, Sevierville, they're all doing about the same in terms of ROI, but it's, you, you know, you need to be in certain locations within those markets that, that will do better than others. So, and that's what you have to do by studying the markets. So isolating, you know, the top, 90th percentile properties going into those properties and saying, why is this bedroom making a hundred thousand first, you know, let's say, let's open this one up and say, you know, uh, let's select another two bedroom. So that one's making a hundred thousand versus this one making 56,000. What's the difference there? And studying that out for every single market that you're looking into to identify what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so that's what you need to do in these markets once you've selected them. Okay, uh, so this is Sleeping Bear. We've talked about, hey, look, it's checking the boxes for tourism. The growth has increased. Um, let's actually check it out inside of uh, the area where you want to look. So let's go up to Michigan. It's going to be right over here. Okay, we're going to go with it. So remember, it's over here. 
the the national park is over here and you've got all these markets sure there's markets further down too you can you know play around with it but look we've got you know a couple of these some of these are less than 100 whatever but you've got several markets in this area that are you know all near each other that have less than a thousand active listings combined it makes a very strong market individually if you were just looking and hunting for these individually in str insights looking at no other data no prior research you'd say well this is a small market i i don't trust it i don't want to be in it so therefore i'm not going to go invest in it but in reality though these markets offer some sort of, you know, there it's a combined region. It's not just this individual location. And there's only cleaners in this individual location. I guarantee you cleaners will go all over here. So overall, this is a good market. Now, this market is a little more pricier. And it's because it's, in my opinion, it's actually borderline like more established slash like getting out of the emerging side and more established because of the growth of Traverse City which does have quite a few active listings, still not thousands, but quite a few um, active listings as well. So you've got really this whole area here that's doing really well. I like it. I like the numbers. I like where it's trending and you can get some amazing deals. You don't have to be over here near the national park. Remember the national parks over here. You can be on one of these lakes and do well. You can be, you know, actually over here. It doesn't matter, but you're in this area. You're in this region or this market. Okay. So this is one that I really like if you're interested in the North. Very seasonal, which someone else brought up as well. Um, the dunes are west of Glen Lake in the brown area of the map. Oh, right here. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, thank you, Guy. Can you look at average revenue specific to different bedroom and bathroom counts? Um, yes. So in STR Insights, you can do that. So if I were to select, let me actually pick a bigger one. Um, you can see the average revenue based on a percentile uh, in SDR Insights here. And you can also filter to see those where those properties are located. Um, so houses for five bed are very different from Custard to Lee. Okay, back to the other one. I live in South Dakota and have been looking to buy there for a little while now. Will it be okay if you reach? Yes, you can reach out. Um, okay. Almost every township in northern Michigan has been very difficult regulation limits on SDRs, no permits available and very slow six month process. So that is a uh, general assumption. That's not true for every market up there. Um, so, I mean, you need to talk to a realtor and it really it is town to town dependent. So a lot of properties won't even fall in a township. So where, where are the regulations there? Um, however, just because there are regulations doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't go invest there. So just that's, that's a rule for everybody. Um, okay. Uh, sleeping bear. Wouldn't that be risky transportation getting there? I mean, Oh, Maggie asked about that. So once again, Maggie, looking at, at the population trends of sleeping bear over 1.5 million people are going there, you know, not a lot of places to stay. So, and that's the benefit of it is I'm looking at foot traffic and I'm looking at supply and does supply meet demand? Not quite in this market. And these are the indicators of it. All right, let's keep moving along here. Okay, go back to this. Let's look at another market. All right, let's get out of national parks and let's focus on another one, universities. So some of the fastest university town grow or universities in the United States obviously impacts the growth in the population of that town. People need places to stay at these universities. Um, you can Google, hey, what are the fastest growing universities or the uh, most populated universe or the uh, have the most students or whatever universities in the United States? And you can Google that and you can look at those cities or those towns that they're in and see, you know, hey, can I short term rental here? And generally, yes, you can do it in a lot of these because a lot of these areas they need, you know, parents come and stay with their kids. There's graduations, there's sporting events. There's a lot of things going on, um, especially the schools in the South. And the reason why the schools in the South is because they're a little more friendlier. The schools up North, like I'm thinking like, um, you know, University or uh, Penn State, even Michigan, they have some strict rules, but in Ann Arbor, but Ann Arbor is a big city. Um, and so be careful, check the regulations, but universities is a great way. So Gainesville, Florida is one I like. Um, so Gainesville is like kind of 
uh, North Central Florida. And uh, they have over like 50, I think in the last year, this is up to 2021, but in the last year they had like 55,000 students, which is a lot of students for a college. Um, and we've also seen, so that's, so you see the growth over time increasing in total enrollment, enrollment for the college. But then if we look at the population of Gainesville as well, we can also see a steady trend line of increase over time. And so you can see growth, you know, oh, you know, comparing the, you know, 2010 to 2020, but, you know, it's a steady increase. Okay. COVID didn't jack it way out of proportion. It's doing way better than it should have normally, you know, originally been doing. It's been steady over time. And when we look at the data in Gainesville, um, let's, so let's go back. Let's go to our, um, well, I can, I'll just type in Gainesville. I mean, Gainesville, so with the, and that's, another, that's another thing too. Um, you can use the map view for this and I think it's cool, but, um, when we're starting to look at like individual cities or towns that have like a university, you know, the smaller markets might not be as advantageous as say some of the, the larger markets in actual Gainesville. So you can go into STR insights and you can actually just type in, Hey, in Gainesville, show me, you know, there's multiple zip codes. Show me what's the best area to invest in, in Gainesville based on the data. You know, and so overall, 12% ROI, that's pretty good for a college town, you know, and then if I'm studying the market and trying to identify where, it's obvious that the closer you are to campus and the actual university, the better that market's going to do. So I do like Gainesville. Um, I am not, and someone might put it in the comments here, is um, Uh, is that uh, the regulations, um, I need to look at the regulations there. It is more moderate. So we have like a little indicator here. So it's a little more open in Florida. Um, and I know Florida has some like rules to protect and also some rules against, but um, it is a good market. And you don't, and that's the thing too, like you don't have to be downtown. You can be outside of it. And I think there's rentals here that are doing well that are outside of it. Um, but overall, it looks like the majority of the popular or the top performers are downtown in that area. Um, but this is a very, this is a good market. It's an emerging market as well. So people, the school is growing, the town is growing. Those are good signs of an emerging market. All right. Now is once again, I'm not comparing an emerging market to say an established destination in terms of, are you going to make more money here or there? But I'm showing you the indicators you can use to identify markets that are growing and doing well that haven't been, you know, uh, impacted severely by COVID or over, I guess, bloated by COVID. So let's take a look at another market. Um, so Gainesville is a good one. College Station. Now, College Station is Texas A&M. So Texas A&M has, you know, we're looking at student population, 72, almost 73,000 students. So you're talking like almost 20,000 more than Florida, which is crazy. It's a huge college campus. A lot of people there. And look, the population of College Station has also grown too. And, you know, you have this increase in uh, in population over time. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for this increase over time and not just in the last few years. I hope I've made that clear. Um, so I really like College Station. And one thing too, so just going back to STR Insights, I know College Station has some regulations in the downtown area, but in fact, the best market that I want, I like, uh, I personally like, that's not even, um, it's just right outside of it because of the regulations is this one is Bryan, Texas. Um, and you can see that here, Bryan is 15%, has a 15% gross ROI over College Station, which only has a 10. And I know College Station, it's got a lot of rentals, but so does Bryan. Uh, as well. And so I, I like, uh, I like that. So you don't necessarily have to be in downtown college station. So the market's different. And that's something too, I encourage you to do is just because I say, Oh, go to a university in like Florida and you know, Gainesville area, go invest in that market and go check out the downtown area. Sure. The properties are doing well, but then you take a completely different market like college station and outside of it's doing better or, you know, about the same, but according to the data, better than what the downtown area is doing. So every market is unique and you need to study the markets just beyond, you know, hey, this is the, the initial data or the thesis going in. Okay. Keep moving. 
All right, let's go to some uh, ski markets because those have become very popular. Um, and there's a few ski markets that I'm, I'm going to show you two. And there's there's two that have really grown. Um, I wanted to show one out west. This market has been around for a while, but has really grown in popularity for um, Southern Californians. And then obviously, uh, you know, people from like – so. Arizonans as well. So uh, Phoenix area. And then also I'm like, I was reading a ton of stuff about Southern Californians coming here and like traveling. And there's even like stops along the way that they plan out. It's, it's become quite popular. So Taos, New Mexico. So the reason why I like Taos is there are four major ski resorts and they're all dumping money into them. So there's Angel Fire, there's Taos Valley, um, and there's a couple other ones, I think like maybe one near Eagle's Nest. I personally never been there. So I'm kind of like, you know, at a loss of words in terms of which one's best and, oh, go to this one or that one. But the, the point is in terms of investing, this is a very good market and I'm going to show you the data behind it. So the, the population, if we just look at population of Taos of the residents has slowly been increasing. Now it's thousands. It's not, you know, tens of thousands. So, okay, take that for a grain of salt, but you can still see an increase which represents the growth of the area and the infrastructure. Also, when we look at the number of skiers per year coming to that area, it's over 1.5 million. All right. So when we look at the supply and the current infrastructure of the markets and the hotels and everything where people can stay, obviously just looking at this number, I can tell you and do the research too, but when you do the research, there's just not a lot of places for these, these people to stay. And if they're driving from California and Arizona and all these other areas, they are, they're either, they either have to stay in Santa Fe or which is, you know, a good distance away, or they're trying to stay here. And there's just not a lot of supply for short-term rentals. Now Taos does have some regulation, but El Prado and the, some of the surrounding areas are really solid as well. But they also announced, Taos did, that they're planning, or the county, Taos County, plans to spend about $300 million in upgrading the resorts. That's a lot of money they're dumping into making these bigger and better ski resorts. And I guarantee you this will get over $2 million and then $3 million in the next decade simply because of the amount of money and investing they're putting into this area. So if you're wanting to focus on uh, a vacation market that's getting established and also one that's growing and that will appreciate, this is a market to be looking into. This is a solid vacation play in an emerging vacation market because of the fact, one, it's skiing, but to all the resorts and the money and the, the stuff they're investing in to make it better and attract more people to it. So I really like this. This is one that's like, you don't hear a lot of people talking about New Mexico, but this is the market to invest in in New Mexico, in my opinion, if you're interested in that. Um, who are staying in the Airbnb, students or the visitors? I think this goes back to the college, um, not students. So you're you're wanting a place. So going back to the universities, uh, the markets there, host families, think parents, um, you know, maybe they're coming for the games, graduation, whatever else is going on. Think about the parents rather than the students, no parties. Okay, next one. This is another big one too. So let's go from West to Northeast. So Sunday River uh, Ski ski Resort or Sunday River Ski. Um, so this area, there's actually two ski resorts here. And it's new, so these markets are Newry and Bethel. Um, it's up in Maine. So this is probably the one of the biggest ski resorts in the Northeast uh, next to like Killington, uh, New York. So the reason why I like Sunday River it's three hours from Boston and like three hours from like Montreal. And then like, I think it's like, like five from New York city or something like that, but it's really close to, you've got those, it's checking the boxes of the key attributes that we're looking for in emerging markets. But when we look at the data too, what, what does it say? So there's no like trend lines. I mean, you can go and look at articles over time and see like how many people went into, you know, Sunday river and, 2010 and like somebody will say, Oh, it broke a record of like 500,000. But in the last decade, it's grown from like 500,000 in 2009 to over a million people are going there in, in this or this past ski season. And this from Sunday river, they're dumping over. Um, oh, I didn't include the number here. I want to say it was like 200 million 
just in the resort. So it's one resort. Oops, go back. Oh, giving away secrets. Um, it's one resort. So here, and it's one of the biggest ones in the Northeast. You can see all compared to the small one over here. It's huge. And they're dumping over $200 million into this resort in the next 10 years. They have like some big, you know, $200 million goal where they're expanding lifts and making, adding more runs and like snow throwers and all this different stuff. But currently you have over a million skiers coming here every single year, but there's only, so they, they, uh, the ski resort broke this down. I love it. There's 6,000 off mountain lodging that include, or on mountain lodging. So there are resorts and stuff. And then off mountains, 2000. So like short term rentals, hotels, all this other stuff, there's really not a lot. And if we go into STR insights and let's do, this is the market one. I might, I might actually have to, I don't know. I forgot where this was in Maine. I think, I think Dave Minipace uh, is on. So he's probably gonna be like, come on, Kenny. Uh, there it is. All right. Um, okay. So here, here is uh, Bethel. Are we, why is it not being on those markets? Do, 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 do. Um, Bethlehem. Come on. There's Bethel. So Bethel's at 14%. And the newer is at 13%. So the ROIs are really, really close. And those are pretty strong for those markets, um, especially a ski market. You're not going to find that kind of ROI in um, Colorado or Utah or California in the ski market, ski markets or Montana. The, this is what I'm talking about in El Prado or Taos or Newry, Bethel. You're getting ROIs over 12 to even 15%. And that's just that's unique for this market. If you're thinking cash on cash terms, you're talking 15 to 20 percent cash on cash in a ski market. So I really like these markets and the money they're investing into the resorts uh, to make them bigger and better. And they're attracting more people. And there's that steady growth over time. Hence why they get labeled an emerging market. So um, and all I did to find this, guys. So one, I heard about this. But two, I'm Googling it. I'm studying it. I'm reading articles. So like there's no national like database I can hack into to see like the travel trends for, you know, Sunday River. So I've got to look at ski resorts. I've got to look at what they publish and I piece it together to get an idea of what the trends will be like in this area and their growth and expansion. And then I look at like the number of active rentals in the market. So like Bethel only has 224. It's not this huge, like robust area. And, um, of a ton of short-term rentals. And the same thing with Newry, 247. I mean, that's over 500 to 600, maybe even like we could say, you know, maybe a thousand in this entire area of short-term rentals. That's not that many for the amount of people that are traveling to this area. So I really, really like that market. Um, can I give an example of golf resorts? I cannot, I'm sorry, Eileen. Um, not that wasn't on there. I uh, that's something I can look into though, um, and I would look into that by googling it, studying the market, looking at the data, looking at the active listing counts and SDR insights in the surrounding markets, and understanding the ROI to know if this is a good emerging market or fits my investment thesis. Okay, let's go into the last one. Frisco, Texas. So, Universal Studios. Um, just announced they're building a new park in Frisco, Texas. So Frisco is north of Dallas. It's a suburb of Dallas. It's actually one of the fastest growing U.S. cities in the United States. And you can see the trend line boop, just pops straight up. So, um, I mean, this is really, really good. So um, right now, Frisco is just kind of a residential city. And their sentiment towards short-term rentals is not super friendly as of currently. However, Universal is coming in, so that's going to change. Now, sure, they could bring in hotels and do other things, but they will, and I've talked to folks there, they are opening up applications and permits for short-term rentals. Frisco isn't just one area you have to be in or one town. There's surrounding areas. And in fact, um, if we just look at a map view of Frisco, uh, let's go, we'll just do it in here because it's simple. Um, we'll go here. Frisco, Texas. So let's let's look at, uh, there's Dallas down here. So if I'm just scrolling out, there's Dallas. 
and then Frisco. I mean, we're like right on the border of, you know, rural Texas land. And so, I mean, you've got Prosper, you've got other areas here where, and they're building the universal up here. So Northern side where there's just not a lot of development yet. So coming in and taking, I'm going to open that up. So coming in and, and finding opportunity in this market um, and in finding properties that, you know, based on the zip code or whatever market, but looking in other, it doesn't have to be Frisco. It can be in Prosper. It can be a surrounding areas because the universal is going to be there. So don't think, oh, it has to be Frisco. Just know that, hey, Frisco is emerging. This area is growing and a universal studios is about to be there. So you can Google this guys. You can go on Google and you can say new theme park announcements and start researching where new theme parks are announcing and going to be. And that can be part of your investment theory or investment thesis. I guarantee you for those who are more sensitive to seasonality, this market's going to be a lot less seasonal than say, you know, a South Dakota or a Maine or even a Taos. So keep that in mind. If you're, Hey, I don't necessarily want to invest in these like more seasonal markets. This one, like when we think of Disney world, Disney world typically is a year round destination. Um, you know, I went in the middle of winter time and I know people who go in the middle of summertime too. So it's sure it's not hundred percent occupied, but it's more, it's less seasonal than say some of these other markets. Um, okay. So any questions about, so that's just one of the, the, that's like a theme park one, but any questions in terms of the theme parks or the ski markets or anything else at, as an emerging market grows into established market, would you anticipate ROI, revenue, and et cetera to increase? Yes, I yes, I would. And that's why, like, so once you find the check the boxes of a market doing well in terms of growth and tourism and demand, look at the revenue trends. How is the revenue doing over time? Most markets, you're gonna see a big COVID bump and they'll start to come back down. But overall, remember, we're looking for trend lines. Uh, that's a bad example. That's like a really, really good trend line. But going back to like the national park ones. I mean, this is like more realistic. This is how revenue will look like in markets that perform well over time. Uh, I like this example better, but it's like going to be some years are going to be really good and other years are going to look a little worse. But overall, it's growing. OK, that's like natural growth. That's what it looks like in business, in life, in like investments, like this is what it looks like in reality. And so certain years are going to be better than other years, but you can see that growth over time. And that's what you should be looking for as your final step, going back to this, like study the data. This is what, that's what you're going to be looking for is that revenue growth beyond just identifying the emerging markets. Okay. Um, which zip codes are currently regulated and around, I, I can't tell you by zip code. I just know that this city has, it's not, and we say regulation, once again, it's not necessarily that it's bad, it's wrong, don't go there. They're banning it. It's just they have some rules and you need to learn what those rules are, but it's not impossible to get into the market, hence why there are active short-term rentals there already. So keep that in mind. Um, your ROI is based on average revenue and value. So if your property is performed in 90th percentile, would you say it's safe to assume an opportunity to outperform STR Insights ROI? I mean, we we can, so like we have the 90th percentile and it can change your ROI value here. So yes, if you're only looking at whatever we throw in the, the markets dashboard, but you can click to see the 90th too and you can see how that changes it. So these are small markets, by the way. So ignore the high numbers there. There's one property. So, but that, that'll give you an idea. Um, so yes, you can theoretically outperform that ROI for the market because we don't invest in markets. We invest in properties within those markets. Um, and I'd hope you perform better than the market. Okay. Do you have some tips on identifying an, an emerging midterm rental market? I don't because I don't invest in midterm rentals. I'm not the expert in that. Um, but I would say the majority of mid-terminal markets would be near urban um, hospitals, things like that, where nurses are going. Um, I think universities are a good play as well, not necessarily for students, but professors, adjunct professors, people traveling, think, uh, and even businesses uh, where new, uh, you know, like new work plants like uh, Ford factory or Walmart or whatever is being built, like Amazon, like places like that are, are good um, 
where you're having like a strong worker supply coming into those markets that those are good midter mid terminal markets and things I'd be looking for. So I would Google that first and study those and look for these trends to start out with. That's what I'm trying to teach you guys is like, you know, here's some examples that we've identified, but what were the key patterns, trends, or attributes that we were able to identify that they all had in common that we can then go and look in other markets. Um, do you have some tip? Okay. That was the other question. All right. Here's some, here are some other uh, emerging markets that I really, really like that I did. I don't have time to get into um, that. I've just seen that are doing really well. So the red river gorge in Kentucky, um, this market is really, really cool and really, really growing. I, I like this market a lot. Um, there's not a lot of inventory and I would actually encourage if you're interested in this market to consider building, this is a really good market to build into. Um, a lot of emerging markets, you might find there's not a lot of inventory due to geographical um, boundaries. Like there's just not a lot of land to build on or sorry, not build on, but there's just not a lot of houses right now um, or whatever limitations, like just, just low property, not a lot of properties for sale. So you might consider building. And building will actually give you an advantage over the current competition there. A lot of people don't realize that it, when you look at a lot of markets, what's the barrier of entry in these markets? Meaning like, what does it take to get into this market and, and compete at the minimum amenity level? Do I need to have, you know, if we take the Smokies, like a lot of properties have swimming pools in the cabins now, which is crazy. But if you go on the other side in North Carolina, no properties have that. And they might not even have hot tubs. And so if you look at Red River Gorge, there are going to be older houses. There's only a few really, really nice ones. And it's really easy to get into that market market and put in a nice property um, and nice amenities and then all of a sudden be at the top. And so that's why I love emerging markets as well is because because of the low supply, there's not heavy competition in terms of amenities, design and decor. And so you can really come in there and crush it and exceed expectations. Um, and I never run my numbers off of expectations. I run them on what the numbers are currently at. And if it pencils out at that, I know that I have a, my ceiling is endless and I can really try to up that revenue and maximize it. But at minimum, I know it's going to pencil out based on what properties are currently doing. Fun fact for you. Okay. So keep that in mind. Um, if you're, so Red River Gorge, I like that. Fayetteville, West Virginia, there's the new... Shoot, I want—I didn't want to mess this up. New River Gorge State uh, National Park. Um, yes, New River Gorge National Park in West Virginia. It's near Fayetteville, West Virginia. Um, once again, I mean, it's very similar to like Red River Gorge. Very beautiful area. I met somebody who's investing in there, and the properties are very cheap. We're talking two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range for cabins, and they're making you know anywhere from fifty up to maybe even a hundred thousand dollars. So um, they're doing really well. It's a great area. This national park's brand new. And so it's obviously going to grow and uh, increase over time. Shenandoah, I've been preaching this one from the, you know, the hilltop Shenandoah National Park. It's near Luray. You've got Washington, D.C. and Baltimore within two hours away. Um, also know people investing here that are doing really, really well. Um, so this is a great market. Greenville, South Carolina. I thought this one was random and I was like not going to put it in there. But then I said, no, I want to look at the attributes of growth. I want to see what the regulations like. I want to check the data and it all checked out. Don't know why Greenville. Uh, I mean, it's a really cool downtown. There's uh, like stuff to do in the area, but this is one that I was kind of like, really? And that's what happens with emerging markets. You'll, you'll learn about these, like the, probably some of the ones I just told you about. And you'd be like, really? That's weird. That's strange. Why would that be emerging market? And then you see the data and you see that people are actually going there and you realize, well, hold on, maybe this makes sense. And so once you un identify these things and you understand the power of Google and how to specifically research the criteria you're looking for, the, these markets start popping up. And then you're looking for the trends and you're checking the boxes to make sure that it hits everything. And then you start looking at the revenue and everything else with it. Um, okay, so any other questions about... Uh, do you guys have realtor contacts that work with you and can help you us identify properties? We do. Um, if you're talking about SDR insights, so I might, you can just reach out. I might know somebody um, depending on the market and oop, 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 let me go back to that in a second, but in SDR insights, let me go back here. Um, you know, we might, let me pick, uh, 
a good friend of mine. I know who, who's on this. Um, oh boy. I can spell. There we go. I did. It was just slow. So like uh, Tony, she's on here listening. So she's our preferred realtor on here. So like she does the Bourbon Trail, Kentucky. Um, I even think she can do the Red River Gorge as well. I'm not sure. Tony, you can tell me. Um, but uh, she she's a great realtor. But yeah, I mean, she specializes in short-term rentals, these people we know. So you, you can find it in SDR Insights or also just DM me and I can tell you somebody too that we work with who might cover that area because I know a lot of realtors. Um, Cool. So that is it, guys. Uh, if you have questions, I'll take. I'll start taking questions as we go here. Um, I do want to offer this. So this is for you guys, for those who are new to SDR Insights, you're interested, or you want to subscribe before we upgrade our tool and start charging more for it. Right now, you can say 15% off. You just use the code Emerge23, um, and this code will expire tomorrow at midnight EST. So Emerge23 at checkout if you're interested in subscribing to SDR Insights. Um, so go and sign up because you need the data. Don't just Google things. Going back to this again, guys. Don't just Google. Don't stop here. You need the data. You do need to understand the revenue and what properties are doing and why they're doing well. So if you go and say, cool, I'm going to go invest in Red River Gorge, like Kenny said, and I'm just going to go buy a property there, or I'm going to go build a property there, where and what attributes does it have that are successful? You need to know what the data is saying about those properties. And the reason why I love STR Insight, and I'm going to get biased here, but I mean, it's my thing, so I can. So the reason why I love STR Insights is because I'm not limited to one market. I have access to all markets anywhere in the United States. So the Red River Gorge, I think this is the closest market, um, Stanton, Kentucky, I mean, it's an area. You've got Red River Gorge is right here, by the way. You've got Pine and Rogers and Zachariah and Slade. These are all different markets that you get access to with a subscription to STR Insights, where I know you can go in other data providers, but you got to pay per market or you got to tell them which ones you want. So we give you access to everything and you can see all the properties in here and, and go from there. So you're not limited on this as well. And then soon, hopefully next week, um, you'll be able to search by zip code. Don't do that in the Red River Gorge because you need to see all markets. But in bigger markets, it's going to be more important, like, say, the Smokies or Florida. So anyway, um, what were you saying about uh, Louisville? Oh, I was just uh, throwing up an example and saying Tony is the go-to realtor. There, she, I guess she does do the Red River Gorge. So contact Tony. Um so Louisville is a great market. I know they have very strict regulations. So just be careful there. Contact Tony. She can tell you all about it. Um, do you think SDR owners need someone to set up the listings professionally on all necessary platforms? Because I just started such a company and try to evaluate the demand. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know if I'm the right one to answer that. So um, anyway, so we maybe talk offline on that one. I'll have to give that some thought. So guys, let me recap this. I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Let me recap this. Put your questions in the comments if you have it, but here's what you do. I gave you a lot of information. I showed you a lot of markets, but here's literally what you do. You need to come up with a thesis. So say, hey, I'm interested in an emerging market and I I don't want it to be seasonal or I, do, I don't care if it's seasonal. I need it to be in this region or I want it to be within driving distance or a plane ride or whatever. Like nail down that personal criteria first, okay? write all that stuff down, then come up with, I've talked about university. Are you interested in universities or you want their national parks or state parks or um, ski or whatever it is, write that down. Then start Googling it. Google what's the foot traffic or what's the tourism like in these particular areas, which, which place is growing Google, like fastest growing places or, or markets in the, that fit that criteria that you've identified. If you just Google fastest growing markets, you're going to get a bunch of garbage. And none of it's going to make sense. You're probably going to get stuff in the suburbs and whatever. So you, the more specific you get, the better results you're going to find. So Google it, break it down, and then check the regulations for those markets. Okay. Once you start, all the boxes are checking. When I say the boxes are checking, I'm talking about there's steady tourism growth, not from the last three years, but the last decade or so. Okay. Check over a million people, preferably within two to three um, major cities. There's nearby attractions, so people are going there for a reason. 
and there's low SDR inventory, then go into SDR insights, look at the active listing count, start studying the data and looking at the uh, market revenue, the occupancy rates, and then what does well in those markets. Okay. If at any point you start getting red flags, stop. It's not going to work. Don't tell yourself a story. Don't force yourself into that market. It's not going to work. Back up and look in other markets. If you're looking to invest today, if you're trying to find a property today, I would recommend looking in three to five markets. Three to five, really studying them out. Don't look everywhere. Identify three to five markets where, and then apply these principles. If anything, like if anything, red flag doesn't work, go out of that market and find another market, but three to five. Um, and then once again, if you're going to subscribe, use this co promo code Emerge23. You get 15% off any of the plans. Um, finally, I will say this. Uh, I know there's it looks like a couple questions. Um, if you haven't if you haven't been a part of my Facebook group, this is a free Facebook group, not related to STR Insights. It's all about data and trends and stuff like that. Uh, join my Facebook group. You know, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. If not, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, okay. Will you make this live available to view later? It's on YouTube. It's, it's literally being streamed right now to YouTube. So you can go to the YouTube. Um, anyway, I can do this like, yep. So, uh, and then Michelle, does, uh, Sanders, I don't, sorry, Michelle, which question did you ask? Are emerging markets going, going to always be classified as small and SDR? No, 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 no. So remember, Emerging market, so going back to the beginning, an emerging market isn't a market, it's a region. So SDR Insights, you know, Price Labs, AirDNA, everybody classifies a market as like this geographical boundaries. If I go back into here, like, you know, oh, this is Stanton, Kentucky, but the market itself is the Red River Gorge, which includes Stanton, Pine Ridge, Rogers, Zachariah, Slade, all this area. So Emerging markets aren't necessarily small. They, they, most of the time they're going to be medium to large. So meaning over around 500 to a thousand active listings. Hope that was helpful. And if I missed a question, please just throw it in. Um, yeah. So my Facebook group guy, somebody asked about this Facebook group is called the, the, the is cut out, but STR data host. So the STR data host, you'll be able to find it, or maybe it's just STR data host. I don't even know <laughs> whatever this is. So go in and, and join that. I'll let you in. Um, and that's just free information, help you guys, uh, you know, understand data trends. I don't just talk about SDR. It's not about SDR insights. It has nothing to do with that. It's about data in the SDR industry and impactful trends that I'm personally seeing or others are seeing and that involve data. Um, does SDR insight or does SDR count all occupied nights via Airbnb to calculate revenue or does it have some sort of actual reservation numbers. Christopher, I'm not 100% sure I understand what that second part is, but basically what we're doing is we're tracking, I think it's probably your first part. So we're counting all occupied nights on Airbnb and VRBO to see what the, to estimate revenue. Um, nobody is actually linked into your bank account. So we don't know what numbers you know, you're actually pulling in, whether you give that guest a discount or, you know, you refund them the money or whatever that is. Like, we don't know that stuff that happens afterwards. So we're estimating your revenue. So that's, that's how we're doing it. Um, okay. We'll keep working on, and Heather, uh, yeah, keep working on Northern Michigan. I think it's a great market, you know, not just um, that area, but all around there as well. Um, and if you have a realtor, if you don't, I know a really good realtor as well in Northern and in, in Michigan in general. And so you can reach out, but you might have somebody already. So either way. So guys, if you like this, I'd love it. I'd really appreciate it. If you could, you know, like, or if you're on YouTube, subscribe to this, um, and leave any feedback, but, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Feel free to join the Facebook group, subscribe to STR insights. If you already have recommend doing so before we do the big release next week. Um, and please reach out if you have any questions and I look forward to, um, seeing you guys in the future. And if you found this valuable, please let me know as well. That'd be helpful. So I know to do this again or not. <laughs> so anyway, um, sweet. I'm going to move this back. Uh, thank you so much for joining and I hope you guys have a good rest of your